This is the chapter on jet propulsion, portion number one. Portion I? I don't know, is that an I or a one? If you have any questions as this lecture is going along, write them down, put an asterisk to it, hit pause if you want to, send me an email right then. I'd really enjoy answering any questions you have, uh, or you can get it all done and email me all the questions or give me a ring as needed. There's four basic types of engines that use jet propulsion to push a flying machine around. Uh, one of them is a rocket. There's two basic kinds of rockets. There are solid rockets, solid fuel rockets, and liquid fuel rockets. Uh, the big difference, well, one big difference between rockets and turbine engines or jet engines as found on airplanes is that the turbine engines on airplanes only have to supply the fuel because they're flying around in the oxidizer. The atmosphere has plenty of oxygen in it. Uh, let's see, 21% uh, if I recall correctly. Uh, so you don't have to carry your oxygen around. That's actually uh, the only disadvantage to rockets over turbine engines is that you have to carry a lot more fuel with you. Correction, you have to carry your oxidizer with you so the weight of your vehicle gets higher. Of course, the advantage of rockets over turbine engines is that you can operate rockets in a vacuum. Um, the advantages of liquid rockets over solid rockets, for instance, if you look at the space shuttle, the three main engines on the space shuttle uh, orbiter itself run off of hydrogen and oxygen, liquid hydrogen, liquid oxygen. And the advantage is that you can change the power setting. They are throttleable. If you don't want to have to try to spell throttleable, you can say you can change the power setting. And you can shut the engine off and start it back up whenever you want. Now, solid rockets are a single speed. Once you light that puppy off, it's going to go to maximum thrust and it's going to burn until it's done. You cannot shut it off and then start it back up when you want. So the advantages of liquid rockets over solid rockets is that you can change the power setting and the advantage is that you can shut it down and then start it back up again. With solid rockets, you can't do either of those. Um, here's a picture of a solid rocket. whoop de doo <laughs> or the correction, that was a liquid rocket. Advantage of a solid rocket over liquid is that if you have a liquid rocket, liquid fueled rocket, the liquid tends to evaporate. We've got these uh, this oxygen and hydrogen at high pressures and low temperatures and after a while you're going to have to come, you know, after a day or two or three, you're going to have to come and re-top it off. Uh, so you can't just let it sit there. So if you look at intercontinental ballistic missiles, all the ones we've got now are solid rocket boosters because you put the rocket in the in the silo and it can sit there literally for years. You've got to inspect it, but you don't have to keep topping off the tanks. Ramjets. Woohoo, ramjets. Uh, ramjets are a very simple engine. The main advantage of a ramjet, well actually I guess there's two advantages. One is it works really good going supersonic and two, it's a very simple engine. It doesn't cost much to make and there's very very few um, moving parts. Here's a picture of a ramjet. Now the thing about a ramjet, let's see if I can get the, the drawer, the, let's see if I can draw a picture here. Whoops. Here we go. This ramjet, this intake, has a duct. And this duct is generally a diverging shaped or divergent. That means it's getting bigger. As the air comes in, it tends to turn. As the air comes in, it tends to turn. So what ends up happening is that its axial velocity, velocity along the engine, goes down a little bit. And of course Bernoulli's theorem, which we'll cover, uh, states that in a closed energy system, going from one part of the system to another part of the system, the total energy is the same. So if our dynamic energy goes down, then that leads to our static energy, or in this case, our static pressure going up. So inside of a divergent exhaust duct is going to lower the velocity, but the static pressure is going to go up. So that's an and. So we're going to end up with, because we have this divergent intake duct, 
we're going to have higher pressure. And so we put some fuel nozzles in here, and we, oh, I guess I could use red, woohoo. We put some fuel nozzles in here, and we burn fuel at a high pressure. The higher the pressure, the more energy that we can extract from it. So the engine's going to be more efficient in producing power if we burn the fuel at a high pressure. Also, if it's at a high pressure, that means we have a lot of molecules per cubic inch. Molecules per cubic inch. And the more molecules of air, that is, the more molecules of air are in here, that means the more molecules of fuel we can burn. So the more molecules per cubic inch there are, the more power the engine can have. Now in a ramjet, it doesn't work very good until we get up to at least 100 knots. It'll work a little bit before that, but it doesn't work very good. At 100 knots, the pressure in here is doing pretty good. And we can squirt fuel in, and it, this picture doesn't show it, but there's got to be an igniter that catches the f fuel on fire. You've got to have an ig some type of, type of an ignition system. It's similar to a spark plug, but higher, uh, higher temperatures to ignite jet fuel. And the fuel catches on fire, and the fuel gets hotter. So we burn fuel, and then we get higher temps, higher temperatures, and so what happens to the molecules, they tend to expand. Let's get rid of that. They tend to expand. As the molecules expand, if we have an airflow coming in here and the pressure right in here is reasonably high, then these gases can't expand forward very easily. They can't expand sideways against the side of the combustion chamber, but they can expand aft. There's this big old hole in the back of the engine. We call it the exhaust duct or the tailpipe. So the gases are going to expand aft, and since they expand aft, their axial velocity is going to go up. And so if the velocity coming in, which is V1, is less than the velocity that's leaving the engine, that's V2, then we will get thrust due to a change in velocity. That's force equals the mass of the air times the change in velocity. And of course, at the same time, if the pressure right here at the exhaust nozzle this pressure in the jet, P sub J, is higher than the pressure out in front of the engine, P sub AM, then we're going to get thrust from having a higher pressure. Higher pressure in here is going to push the engine forward. So this is AND. AND will get thrust due to the area of the jet times the, the change in pressure between having a higher pressure in the tailpipe and a higher pressure in the intake. Let's see if I got it all. Oops. Here is one, here is a production ramjet. The problem with ramjets is they don't work good until you get them up past 100 knots, which means on takeoff it doesn't work out very good. The nice thing is, with an SR-71, it has a jet engine inside of it. Let's see if I can draw here. If we take a jet engine that's inside of an SR-71, it's got a turbojet in it. So I'm going to really fast draw a diagram of a turbojet engine. It's going to pull air in, it's going to blow air out the exhaust pipe, but around that is another duct. And look at this duct right here, it's divergent. That means the pressure, the velocity is going to go down, and the pressure is going to go up. And we're going to keep this high pressure all the way to the back of the engine. Oh wait, let's squirt some fuel in here. Woohoo! So we've got this high pressure air, we squirt fuel in it, and now we can get the velocity to go up even faster than it would have before. This is the only engine I know of that was ever mass produced where they actually, you put a turbojet engine in the side, inside of a ramjet engine. Here is the Hiller Hornet. It's kind of hard to decide whether or not to say whether they put it in production or not. They made quite a few of them. I think it was over 200 for the U.S. Army back in the 1950s. But they never did anything with it, and then they took them all out of service. But on the wing tip was ac is actually a ramjet engine. And they would actually come out here with a big lighter and light this thing off, and then reach up and give it a spin to get it to spin. Remember, this is on the outside of this big circle, so you could get this thing up to 100 knots pretty easily at the blade tip. And I'm going to guess, I'm making this up, but it probably has like a 300 knot 
blade tip speed uh, at normal RPMs of this rotor, uh, and it was a ramjet, and they'd pump fuel up through the rotor system out to the ramjets. How cool is that? Of course, that made an awful lot of noise. Woohoo! But those are the only two production models of ramjets that I know of. Made a lot of experimental ones, but the da- disadvantage to ramjets is that. Whoops. Oops, let's go back. The disadvantage to ramjets is that there's two of them. One of them is they don't work until you get up past 100 knots, which means you have to have some alternative method of getting them up to speed before they start doing much good. And secondly, they're extremely fuel inefficient. That is, they have terribly bad fuel economy. Pulse jet. There's only one I know of that went into mass production, although there are for airplanes, you mean for big airplanes. Uh, but the, I believe that for model airplanes, they do have some pulse jets you can buy to put in your model airplanes. Um, here, I'll show you how it works. Here's these valves right here are spring-loaded to the closed position, just like this. These valves are spring-loaded. But if you fly fast enough, you can, and the pressure in here is reasonably low, then you can push these valves open and have air come inside. If you have fuel squirting out and you also have uh, some type of an ignition system like an igniter, you can catch the fuel on fire and have all this fuel catch on fire. Well, guess what? Just like in a, a ramjet, if the fuel gets burned, the temperature goes up, and the molecules are going to expand, they're going to bounce around or the volume is going to try to expand because the molecules are bouncing around they're going to try to expand sideways, they're not going to, whoops, they're not going to be able to expand sideways very much they're going to start expanding forward, but as soon as they're expanding forward that's going to push on these valves and push them closed that's going to push these valves closed as it expands and once it closes these valves now the air can't expand forward anymore but guess what? Yeah, that's right. There's a big old hole in the back of the engine called the exhaust, called the tailpipe, called the the jet nozzle. So the only way, after a very, very short period of time, that the air can expand in any direction is to expand aft and blow out the tailpipe. And once again, if the velocity in front is V1 and the velocity in the back is V2, as long as V2 minus V1 is a positive number, we're getting thrust due to a mass of air being accelerated and also we're going to get thrust as long as the pressure right at the tailpipe pressure in the jet nozzle is higher than pressure ambient then we're going to have area of the jet that's the area of the jet nozzle times the change in pressure is going to also give us thrust at the same time now what's going to happen here is that since no air can get into the engine anymore, this fuel is going to burn and burn and burn until the oxygen's gone. When the oxygen's gone and the air has expanded and gone out the tailpipe, the pressure inside of here, the pressure, the pressure is going to go down. So if we've got a forward speed, the pressure pushing the valves open will open and push the valves open and we'll come back up here and it'll push the valves open, we'll get new oxygen in here, we'll squirt in some more fuel, we'll ignite it again, and the process will start all over again. These valves in the front of the engine open and close, open and close, open and close. That's why it's called a pulse jet, because the engine actually makes a pulsing noise. In fact, in World War II, the only version of a pulse jet that got made was the V2 buzz bomb in Germany and launched off of catapults off of the French coast to fly over England. I think they had a 2,000 pound warhead, but it had that pulse jet there on the top. And uh, here's the pulse jet. And they, But they had to launch it off of a catapult and get this thing flying up to speed so the engine would have enough intake speed to be able to get enough decent thrust. And then there was a big fat 2,000 pound warhead in here and they had had some gyros. It was a pretty trick machine to keep it flying straight. And then it would run out of gas and descend and then blow things up on the other end. I hate when that happens. When, when things blow up. Now, from this point forward... Unless otherwise specified, when I say the word jet engine, 
I'm talking about a gas turbine engine, a turbine engine, the kind of engines that are in everyday jets, the kind that you're going to fly. Let's talk about the basic operation of a turbine engine, a gas turbine engine. Now they blew it here. Look at this. This isn't a diverging duct, so they actually misdrew this duct. The duct ought to be slightly diverging, so as the air goes in, we can increase the pressure. Then we're going to have a compressor in here. So we're going to have an intake. We're going to have a compressor. You don't have to draw this right now. Don't worry. I'm going to let you draw it later. And this compressor is going to increase the PSI. This compressor, the PSI is going to go up. And and the molecules per cubic inch are going to go up as well. And then we're going to squirt fuel in and we're going to have that combustion. Once again, we're going to burn fuel. The temperature is going to go up. The gases are going to expand. And since in this combustion chamber, upstream from it is a really high pressure. Remember, we kick the pressure up, especially in the compressor. The pressure up, it can't expand forward against the high pressure. It can't expand sideways against the engine. The only place it can expand is out this big old hole in the tailpipe called the jet nozzle. See, oh, check it out. Whoops. Yeah, I think I must have hit it. All right. We'll keep going. Yay, back where I was. I'll stay with red here. The jet nozzle. See? Well, check it out. The jet nozzle. The only place the gases can expand is aft. So that gives us our increase in velocity. So the only thing that this uh, combustion chamber here does for us in the end, you could say it increases the velocity of the gases. Now, we got to have something to drive the compressor. we got to have something to drive this compressor. It takes horse, this compressor takes horsepower. So what we're going to do is we're going to run these, these exhaust gases. Hmm, I thought I erased it. Oh, it's keeping it. Okay. I'll have to figure out how to get rid of that. We're going to run these gases through a turbine. This turbine is just a fan, except instead of uh, it blowing air, air blows it. And this fan is going to spin around and around, and it's going to extract energy to drive this shaft, and this shaft is going to run the compressor. So that's why we have turbines in jet engines, is to run the compressor. The nice thing is, since we have the compressor, we can get nice high pressures inside of the combustion chamber without moving forward. We can have V1 out here equals zero knots. And we can blow air out the tailpipe at 500 knots or faster. Whoops, that was pretty interesting. It turned pink. I wonder if I did that. In any case, the advantage of a turbine engine over a ramjet or a pulse jet is that we can have high power settings and develop lots and lots of thrust, even though we don't have a forward speed of the engine greater than zero. And because we're going to use this compressor to increase the pressure in addition to the intake and bring really, really high pressures, really, really high pressures into the combustion chamber, it's much, much, much more fuel efficient. Much, much, much more fuel efficient. And if we choke down this nozzle, if we turn this nozzle so it is slightly convergent, then the opposite, uh, then Bernoulli's law comes into play. Starting at the exhaust nozzle and ending at the exhaust nozzle, Bernoulli's theorem says that across a closed energy system, that is, no energy is added or subtracted, no air escapes or is put in, which is from, from right here to right here is what's doing that, the energy at any given moment is the same. If you stick your finger, if you have a garden hose and you stick your thumb over it, what happens to the water speed coming out? It goes up. It's because you're constricting. You're constricting. You're making a convergent nozzle. So if we res restrict the nozzle by making it convergent, that'll make the velocity go up. 
So that's V2 goes up. And yes, the opposite is true. If we make the velocity goes up and the energy from the beginning to the end stays the same, if we increase the dynamic energy, then we're going to have to decrease the static energy. So the pressure is going to go down some. And yes, we want as high a pressure in this exhaust pipe as we can, and we want the highest velocity. But some engineer somewhere with a big fat calculator is figuring out exactly how much to squeeze this down, how convergent does it need to be, so that although we'll lose a little thrust because we have less pressure, we'll make up for it and more if we have a higher velocity. So, so in a turbine engine, the big differences between a ramjet and a rocket and a pulse jet is that we have a turbine. These hot gases, actually, it would be better to say not, not that they aren't hot because they are certainly hot. Whoops. Maybe what we ought to say here is high velocity. High velocity gases drive a turbine, and the turbine drives the air, the compressor. What's rather interesting is that in that turbine engine here, I'm going to draw a stick diagram. You don't have to draw it yet. Don't worry. I'm, you'll have your chance to draw a stick diagram of a jet engine. Here and here's the turbines, and here's a combustion chamber. Oops. Intake's on this side. Exhaust is on the right. This fuel energy that we're burning, this fuel that we're burning, expanding gases, expand aft, the velocity goes up here in the combustion chamber about two-thirds of the fuel that is burned inside of the combustion chamber these turbines here extract it and send this energy down the main shaft of the engine to drive the compressor although two-thirds is 66.66 we're gonna say since I'm asking for a percentage and this will make more sense later we're gonna just say this is 66 percent of the fuel energy is used to drive the compressor so that means what's left after these turbines are in here What's left is about a third of the energy left over. We're going to get into the ex more accurate numbers, and we're going to do some things with this one third that's left over. But right now, I'd be really happy if you understood that jet engines, two thirds or 66% of the fuel energy is extracted by the turbines just to drive the compressor. That's a lot. That is a lot. And of course, the advantages. I already mentioned of turbines over other jet propulsion engines. Uh, one advantage is that turbine engines flying through the air don't have to carry their own oxidizer around so the aircraft can weigh less. You can carry more stuff, more cargo passengers, or fly farther if you carried more fuel. And of course it has better fuel efficiency than pulse jets or ramjets. Both of those are very fuel inefficient. Both of them have terrible gas mileage, if you want to put it that way. And of course the other advantage turbine engines have over ramjets and pulse jets is they will produce full power even when the engine isn't moving. So on takeoff you don't have to have a catapult or something to get you going up to speed. Reciprocating engines versus turbine engines. When I say reciprocating engines, I'm talking about piston engines, gasoline, and now some diesel engines where the piston is going up and down or back and forth, hence the term reciprocating. Um, turbine engines for the same horsepower cost about four times more. Uh, there's two main reasons why. One of them is that the metal that jet engines are made of, or the different metals that jet engines are made out of, cost a lot more. They have to withstand higher temperatures, higher pressures, higher loads, so they cost more because they've got to do better. Secondly, a uh, piston engine, when you build those parts, they don't have to be quite as nearly, actually, nearly as accurate as jet engine parts do. When you build a jet engine part, it has to be exactly the right size, otherwise the, the engine will be out of balance and it'll vibrate too much or it'll rub against something that and it's got to go faster RPM. So if you don't build a part just the right size, the engine is going to fail. So when you're using machines to grind down the parts, you have to be very, very accurate. So it takes more time and more complicated machines to do it, and that costs money. 
if you took, uh, let's say, take a Piper Malibu, no, or a Piper Malibu. Uh, it's a six-seat pressurized airplane, low wing. It's like a Piper Aero, set bigger. And when they came out, they had reciprocating engines in them. And then they came out with the Piper Meridian. And the Piper Meridian has a Pratt & Whitney PT6 engine on it. Uh, the Beach 1900 airplanes, the twin engine jobs that Great Lakes Airlines flies out there at the airport, that has a model of a Pratt & Whitney PT6. Uh, then there's different models. They're the same basic design. Some put out more horsepower than others. Let's just say that you took a Piper Malibu that had the piston engine in it, and it put out 300 horsepower, and it's turbocharged, and we'll say it'll maintain that 300 horsepower up to 15,000 feet. And let's say the Piper Meridian that you put a PT6 in it, let's say they put a PT6 in it that only put out 300 horsepower. Let's say if you loaded up the airplanes to the exact same gross weight, and you took those airplanes off and climbed them up to 15,000 feet, and you had the same propeller, same airframe, same drag, same altitude, you'd go the same airspeed. Now, the turboprop, to develop the same horsepower, that engine would weigh less. So that's one of the advantages that turboprops have over reciprocating engines, is for the same power, they weigh less. Well, if they weigh less, that means you can carry more passengers or cargo or fuel. And then the second advantage that turboprops have over reciprocating engines is that they'll maintain that horsepower to higher altitudes than the piston engine would, even if the piston engine had a turbocharger on it. So if we had this 300 horsepower piston engine and this 300 horsepower turboprop, and we took them off and they both could maintain 300 horsepower up to 15,000 feet, if we kept going higher, the turboprop, yes, the turboprop horsepower would get less, but it wouldn't get less as fast. The turboprop would be able to go to a higher altitude because it would be able to maintain uh, horsepower to a higher altitude when there's less air. And of course, that also means if we could go to a higher altitude, there's less drag. If we were at a different altitude and it was a higher altitude, then you'd be able to go faster. But if it was at the same altitude and the same horsepower going through the propeller, same drag, same weight, the advantage is that the engine weighs less. Um, a piston engine, when you move the throttle, that engine can withstand really fast changes in airflow. Turbine engines, the blades that rotate, are fixed pitch blades, and they cannot handle a fast change in airflow. So that's one of the two reasons why reciprocating engines can handle and have a faster change in acceleration or deceleration of engine RPM is because jet engine airflow is extremely important, and you can't just increase it or decrease it over a second or two like you can in a recip. Second reason is that on a reciprocating engine, most of the engine weight is the engine case, the outside of the engine. The small amount of the weight of a piston engine is the part that's rotating, so it does not have very much inertia, so it can change RPM because it doesn't have very much momentum. A jet engine, on the other hand, the majority of the weight of, the, of a jet engine is the rotating part of the jet engine. It does have a lot of inertia, and so it's harder to change the RPM fast because you have to add or subtract a lot of momentum or a lot of inertia from it. Turbine engines vibrate so much less than piston engines do. Hey, the piston engines, they're called reciprocating engines. The piston moves back and forth. It's going to vibrate. You can't get rid of it. You can try to balance it and you can reduce it, but piston engines are going to vibrate. Recipro reciprocating engines are going to vibrate. Jet engines, do they vibrate? Yes, they do, but it's not even close. Since the vast majority, 99%, 99.9% .9 of what in a jet engine that moves is spinning around in a perfect circle. If you balance that jet engine really well, then it's going to vibrate an extremely small amount. And in fact, it's so small that it's very common to have vibration sensors on the airplanes. And if vibration gets too high, that means something's really wrong and you need to pull the engine back to idle or maybe even shut it down. And hey, that's great. If you had, what if you had a piston engine that was big enough to power a 777? Think about the vibration off of that engine. Turbine engines weigh less. I already said that they weigh less for the same horsepower. The question is why? Well, you've got to understand in a piston engine as that, uh, you know what? I think I'm going to draw you a picture. 
of why it is. Let's say you take that uh, piston on the side of an airplane engine and you have a piston on the inside and it's connected to the crankshaft and this piston goes back and forth. It reciprocates. This piston has to go down or go in this direction while we let air in an intake valve. Then when the engine's all the way down, before it starts to come up, we're going to close off this and the piston's going to come up and it's going to compress the air down so it's really small. So we're then going to compress the air. So we're going to intake. You've probably heard all this before. I'm not going to make you draw pictures of a piston engine. I'm not going to ask you to describe the operation of the piston engine. Just hang on for a second. So we pull, the piston comes down and we pull in air. Then the valve closes and the piston comes up and we compress the air. Now the air is really small, but the pressure in here is really high, and the molecules, molecules, that's hard for me to spell, molecules per cubic inch are really high. So high pressure means we can extract a lot of energy. If we got a lot of molecules in there, we can squirt in a lot of fuel. So we got this fuel air mixture in here. Now we're going to turn on the spark plug and it's going to fire. Now we're going to have the fuel burning. It's just like a jet engine. Fuel is going to burn. Well, it's not quite like fuel is going to burn. The temperature is going to go up. This probably sounds familiar. And then the gases are going to expand. And they won't be able to expand because the piston's in the way. So now the pressure is going to go up, which is different than a jet engine. The pressure is going to push down on the piston, and that's connected to the crankshaft. So that's where we get the power. So as the piston gets pushed down, that's the power stroke. That's where these gases are pushing down on the piston, and we finally get some power. Then when the piston starts to come back up, we open up another valve. That's the exhaust valve and the piston pushes the exhaust gases out. When the piston gets all the way up to the top, this valve closes, the intake valve opens up, and we start over again. You'll notice there's one, two, three, four strokes. This is a four-stroke engine. It's also called the auto cycle. Well, you'll notice of these strokes, only one out of four of them are producing power. Literally, three quarters of the time, this cylinder is not producing any power. Three quarters of the time. Jet engine. Don't have to draw it yet. Give me another slide or two. Jet engine. This is tough trying to draw with this thing. We got a jet engine, and we have a combustion chamber in there. And th we've got a fuel nozzle squirting fuel in here. And it makes noise. Jet engines make noise. This intake is letting in air all the time. The compressor is compressing the air all the time. The combustion chamber is burning fuel all the time. The turbines are extracting energy to drive the compressor. And we're blowing air out the tailpipe uh, all the time. This combustion is occurring 100% of the time, or four-fourths of the time. Do you see why jet engines produce four times as much power for the same weight? It's because the combustion chamber is releasing energy from the fuel all of the time, not just a fourth of the time. And here's a really nice picture that really, really illustrates this. This is a turboprop installed on the nose of a World War II B-17 bomber. And you'll notice if you look at the propellers on the four radial piston engines, those are reciprocating piston engines, you'll notice they're all feathered. They're not working. Essentially, this one turboprop has enough power has four times the power of any of those piston engines. There's a four to one ratio. You're getting this four to one weight, four to one power. Wow, that's a cool, great ratio. Okay, DFM, that means draw from memory. So we're going to see how well I can draw this. Uh, first engine is going to be a turbojet engine. Whoops, and then we'll do a turbofan. Turbojet. I think I'll try a different ink here. So this is a turbojet engine. All right, turbojet. 
We'll draw it nice and big, so hopefully it'll show up decently on the screen. Turbojet straight lines. We're going to make this a really, really, really jet e easy jet engine. We're going to have some compressor blades. Hopefully they don't touch the side. And I'm not going to be you know bent on how many of them. Let's just say four or five. And we're going to have a shaft that runs through the engine. And we need a couple of turbine blades. Let's draw two turbine blades. And then we're going to put combustion chamber in here. Now on the test, I'm probably I'm going to give you a question, and it's going to be draw the stick diagram of a turbojet or a turboprop or a turbofan or maybe more than one, and then I'm going to say draw an arrow showing the airflow through the entire engine. So here I'm going to pick a different color. On the test, you do not have to use multicolored pens. But I want you to draw an arrow, and we're going to label it airflow. We're going to label it core airflow. And that's air that's going through the entire core of the engine. You're also going to label the intake. And please put your, let your arrows towards the metal. Don't point it towards the middle of nothing. The intake. And here is the compressor. And here we have the combustion chamber. You can call it a combustor or a combustion chamber. And here we have the turbines. And then, of course, we need the exhaust. So I'll repeat that practice test question. And there's one in the blue pages. It says, draw a stick diagram of a turbojet engine. Label the five basic components, sections of the engine. Draw an arrow or arrows that show the airflow through the entire engine. And label the arrow of the airflow. So now I'm going to try a turbofan. Now on the test, when I say draw a picture of a turbofan, I'm going to say draw a, a stick diagram of a turbofan and label everything that's not already on a turbojet. So I'm going to put the engine back in here. Is that what I wanted, a turbofan? Yep, turbofan. So we're going to have a turbo fan now. And coming off of that compressor, we're going to put a big old honking fan. It's going to be huge. And we're going to put a big old honking duct on it. A big, big duct. Big, 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 big duct. Okay. So, guess what? This fan right here, this fan, it's going to take a lot of horsepower. So we're actually going to have to extract more energy out of the engine to run it. The first two uh, turbines can drive the compressor, but we're going to need another turbine or two in here to drive the fan. So on the shaft, now we have enough power to run the fan, the, sh the compressor, and we also have enough power to run the shaft. And this question is going to say, draw the stick diagram of a turbofan and label everything on the engine that's not already on a turbojet. Well, we got turbines on a turbojet, but you know what? A turbofan has extra turbines. So we're going to write in here, we're going to say extra turbines. And I looked it up. You can say turbines and you can say turbines. Both of them are the correct pronunciation. Hey, we got a fan. Sure enough, we have a fan. So a fan is on a turbofan and not on a turboprop. I mean, and not on a turbojet. And this big old honking long duct. There's a duct on a, all turbofans, and they're not on turbojets. And the question is also going to say, draw an arrow or arrows to, to show all the airflow through the entire engine and label them. Well, we still got to have air going through the engine so that we can burn fuel in here. But we're also going to blow air through the fan. And we're going to call this bypass air. 
airflow. This bypass airflow is not going through the engine core, hence the term bypass. It's bypassing the blade, or it's bypassing the engine core. So we're going to have airflow that goes through the core of the engine, then we're also going to have airflow that goes through the bypass, or goes through the fan. So on this engine, what's on a turbofan that's not already in a turbojet? Well, yeah, we need an intake, we need compressor, combustor, turbine, and exhaust, but we need extra turbines to drive the fan, because now we need energy for it as well as the compressor. And we're, all, we're always going to find a duct on a turbofan. And in addition to having air going through the engine so the engine will run, we also have air going through the fan, and we're going to call that bypass airflow. So here would be the answer to the test question. Label, a tur draw a stick diagram for a turbo fan, label all the parts that aren't already found on a turbo jet, and then draw an arrow or arrow showing all the airflow and label the airflow. If you have to hit pause to write this all down, I mean to draw that, go for it. Turbo jet, turbo fan, turbo prop, okay, turbo prop. <laughs> All right, this is going to be a turbo prop. Still got the basic stuff, but you know what? We need a reduction gearbox. And we are going to put, in fact, I can't even make the propeller big enough. I want this propeller to be huge, bigger than the fan. So the bottom of the propeller, you're not even going to find it. So we're going to put a big old honking propeller on it. And now we're going to label everything that's not already on a turbojet. Extra turbines, just like a, a turbofan, in addition to needing power off of the turbines to drive the compressor, we also need power to go through this reduction gearbox. and slow the RPMs down before it gets to the propeller. Oh wait, I guess we could label the propeller. And I'll, I'll be okay if you just use the word prop. We all know what propeller is. So in a turbo prop engine, we still have an intake, we've got a compressor, we've got combustion chamber going on, we've got turbines. We need extra turbines to drive the reduction gearbox that drives the propeller. And we still need this core airflow going through the engine. It goes all the way through the engine, just like it did before on all the other engine types. And we still have a bypass airflow. Nobody outside of this class is going to say that propellers have bypass, but I am, because the concept of having a bypass to the engine core is the same with the turboprop as it is with a turbo fan. So when the test question says, draw the stick diagram of a turboprop engine, and then label everything that's not already on a turbojet, you're going to have to make sure you put in the extra turbines, make sure you put in the reduction gearbox, make sure you put in the propeller, label the extra turbines, the reduction gearbox, and the propeller, and then the question is going to say, draw an arrow or arrows for all the airflow through the entire engine, and for the purposes of this class, we're going to say the propeller is part of the engine. And so not only will you need core airflow going through the intake, compressor, combustor, turbines, and exhaust, you'll also need the bypass airflow that's going through the propeller. And then the last one, the last engine is a turbo shaft engine. Mm -hmm. And this one's real easy. Output shaft. 
Looks a whole lot like a turbo prop, doesn't it? Except it doesn't have a prop. This output shaft, you're going to find turbo prop, turbo shaft engines. Oops, I need to write turbo shaft. Turbo shaft engines are found on helicopters and auxiliary power units, APUs. And the purpose of a turbo shaft engine is, is, is not to produce thrust like a turbofan or a turboprop or a turbojet, to, but to produce shaft horsepower. So we're going to call it output shaft. And this shaft can drive an electrical generator if it's an APU. It can drive an air compressor if it's an APU. Or if it's in a helicopter, it's going to be powered to the helicopter transmission to spin the rotors. So here's the practice test question. Draw a stick diagram of a turboshaft engine. And of course, that's going to include the intake, the comb compressor, the combustor, the turbines, and the exhaust. And it's going to say, and draw everything else that's on a turboshaft engine that's not already on a turbojet, which is going to be the extra turbines, because we need the extra turbines to drive the reduction gearbox to drive the output shaft. And of course, a turboshaft engine, in addition to having that extra turbines, also has a reduction gearbox, just like a turboprop. And now, instead of driving a propeller, we're going to say that it drives an output shaft. Turbine engines spin amazingly fast. 5,000, 10,000, 20,000, 30,000. The cutaway eight, uh, jet engine in the uh, classroom, that C-250, was designed for helicopters. One of the shafts inside that engine spins at 55,000 RPMs. Well, the output shaft is only 6,000 RPM, so you have to reduce that RPM. Same thing with turboprops. We need propellers that spin, you know, 1,000 RPMs, 1,500 RPMs, 2,000 RPMs, because they're big, so you got to spin them slower. But the engine, the turboprop engine, is spinning 5,000, 10,000, 20,000 RPMs. So so you're always, always going to find a reduction gearbox on a turboshaft engine, and you're always, always going to find a reduction gearbox on a turboprop. We did turbojet, turbofan, turboprop, turboshaft. I don't think I need the pictures anymore. So there's jet propulsion, section one. If you have any questions, please send them to me so I can answer them right away. And of course, if you have any improvements on jet propulsion, section one, I would love to hear it so I can do better next time. Remember, you got more lectures this semester with me, so if you've got any improvements, please, I encourage you to send them to me. I won't take it personally. I'd be rather pleased if you could find a better way to do this and let me know.